For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We do not talk about this passage very often, and yet I believe it is essential in the teachings of Jesus Christ. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Martin Luther, in his sermon on the first commandment, picks up this very theme. He writes, anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. Where is your heart? What does your heart depend on? Luther's sermon is included in the large catechism, and I will cite larger parts of it today. Luther speaks very clearly to the point Jesus is making when he asks people to trust God above all else. Actually, Luther defines God as that in which we put our ultimate trust. He says, where you put your trust and faith, that defines who you believe in. Is it God or is it an idol? Listen to Luther's world, words and be aware that he sometimes speaks with God's voice as if God would be answering the question in this passage. The first commandment, you are to have no other gods. That is, you are to regard me alone as your God. What does this mean and how is it to be understood? What does to have a God mean or what is God? Answer, a God is the term for that which we are to look for all good and in which we are to find refuge in all need. Therefore, to have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe in that one with your whole heart. As I have often said, it is the trust and faith of the heart alone that makes both God and an idol. If your faith and trust are right, then your God is the true one. Conversely, where your trust is false and wrong, there you do not have the true God. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. The intention of this commandment, therefore, is to require true faith and confidence of the heart, which flies straight to the one true God and cling to him alone. What this means is, see to it that you let me alone be your God and never search for another. In other words, whatever good thing you lack, look to me for it and seek it from me. And whenever you suffer misfortune and distress, crawl to me and cling to me. I myself will give you what you need and help you out of every danger. Only do not let your heart cling to or rest in anyone else. End of citation. I wish the rich man in Jesus' parable had known Luther's writings. It would have helped him greatly, I believe, to set his priorities right. He relies completely on his possessions. God does not even enter the picture in his mind. Neither does the possibility to share his overflowing harvest with people in need. No, he will build huge storage units to lock away even larger amounts of grains and goods which he cannot possibly eat himself, even in two lifetimes. And isn't that a mode of behavior we hear about every day? People stacking away their riches, unbelievable amounts of riches, which no person or family could ever use up even in hundred lifetimes because nobody else deserves to have what, what we have earned with our own hands work or maybe inherited or made at the stock exchange or cheated other people out of. However that might be, it is our money and none of it shall belong to anybody else ever. Money is Luther's prime example with which he shows how easy it is to put your trust into idols and not God. After all, having money does make us feel good and especially safe. Listen to Luther's words. 
There are some who think that they have God and everything they need when they have money and property. They trust in them and boast with them so stubbornly and securely that they care for no one else. They too have a God, mammon by name, that is money and property, on which they set their whole heart. This is the most common idol on earth. Those who have money and property feel secure, happy, and fearless, as if they were sitting in the midst of paradise. On the other hand, those who have nothing, doubt, and despair, as if they knew no God at all. We will find very few who are cheerful, who do not fret and complain if they do not have mammon. This desire for wealth clings and sticks to our nature all the way to the grave. End of citation. Jesus wishes us to liberate ourselves from this idol of money. That is what the gospel passage is about. Do not rely on your possessions, rely on God. Jesus' suggestions are quite consequential. He says, if you have lots of money, give it away so that you don't even come into temptation to value it more than God. If you have no money, don't even start worrying about it. God takes care of the birds and the flowers. Why should God not take care of you? If Jesus' approach seems too extreme to you, always remember that his main point is not about money. His main point is about the role money plays in your lives. Do you use it as a tool to pay your bills and to do good in the world? Or do you cling to it and worship it as if it were your God? Anything on which your heart relies and depends, says Luther, that is really your God. Where is your heart? What does your heart depend on? Not all treasures of our hearts have monetary value. Mammon is the most common idol, but not the only one around. The passage from the Gospel of Luke we have been reading on recent Sundays, so other passages, they have one common message. Jesus asks people to discern their priorities. Someone announces to Jesus in chapter 9, I will follow you wherever you go. I I just have to take care of the following few but urgent tasks before I come. Oh, yeah, this too. Oh, and Jesus responds, you have to make a choice. Will you follow me or will you take care of urgent business at home? In chapter 10, Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite choose their own urgent business over helping a neighbor in need. And Jesus says, Do not act like them. Act like the Samaritan who follows me by putting the need of his neighbor before his own. Then we hear about Jesus' visit with Martha and Mary. Martha is busy with necessary household tasks. But Jesus says, this is not your priority right now. Your sister who is sitting at my feet made the better choice. Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. Where is your heart? What does your heart depend on? Jesus challenges all these people just where their heart is. For the would-be follower of Jesus, it was connection to family. For the priest and the Levite, it was pride in their professional calling. For Martha, it was her identity as a superb housewife. Jesus does not question these people's callings or lifestyles as such. He just makes them ask themselves, what is your highest priority? Is it family or God? Work or God? Home or God? Money or God? Idols can be anything. Martin Luther lists learning, wisdom, power, prestige, family, and honor among the most likely culprits besides money and possessions. But the first commandment 
requires of us to place our heart and confidence in God and God alone. Listen one more time to Luther's words. Let each and every one then see to it that you esteem this commandment above all things and not make light of it. Search and examine your own heart thoroughly and you will discover whether or not it clings to God alone. If you have the sort of heart that expects of him nothing but good, especially in distress and need, and renounces and forsakes all that is not God, then you have the one true God. On the contrary, if your heart clings to something else and expects to receive from it more good and help than from God, and does not run to God but flees from Him when things go wrong, then you have another God, an idol. This is quite a challenge Luther is throwing out to us here. When I duck down deep into my heart, there are quite a few things I will find there besides God. And remember, the challenge is not to love nothing else but God. Of course, you love your family, have passion in your calling, and enjoy worldly things. The challenge is to put God first, before everything else you care for. The challenge is not to replace God with something else or to put something before God. I had a pastor once, his name is Pastor Ben, and he followed the following method of self-examination. He had a chalkboard hanging in his hallway, and these words were written on it in the following order. God, spouse, children, church. This was the order of his priorities. God came first, always. Ben's relationship to God was his first priority. Then came his wife. After all, she had only one spouse to rely on him, and he had only her. His third priority were his children. He and his wife were responsible for their upbringing. These relationships were very important to him. And then in fourth place came his church, the congregation which was put into his care. He loved his church dearly. But you know how it goes in daily life. Priorities sometimes get muddy and unclear. So whenever a member of the family felt that Ben's order of priorities was amiss, let's say the children moved up before the spouse or the church moved up before the children, then they would indicate that on the board. The family would meet, talk things over, and set the list of priorities right again clear away the muddiness of daily life. It is important to have your order of priorities in place. If you don't, something will always become in between you and your relationship to God, you and your family, you and your work, you and yourself. That is also important to take care of yourself. So, why don't you take this week and have a look at your order of priorities. I can tell you what belongs in first place. That would be God. What comes next? And after that? Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. Where is your heart? And where do you want it to be? Amen.